Salvation sounds a new beginning As distant hearts begin believing Redemption's bid is un. Good morning and welcome to Sterling Vineyards Online Church. Today is Palm Sunday and we are delighted that you're able to join with us this morning to worship. Shortly Megan will be leading us through communion and we would love to invite you to join us for that. If you would like to get your bread and drink ready now is the time. And whilst you're getting that organised I thought we could just highlight some announcements and activities that are happening in the life of our church. Yeah, so next Sunday is Easter Sunday, as you all know, and before the service there will be a Sterling Vineyard Kids Zoom call at 9am. This is a great opportunity for young people to get together, play some games and have some Easter themed fun. Fiona will be leading this, and so if you'd like to get the details on how to join, you can email us at hello at sterlingvineyard.co.uk or contact us on social media. And as we count down towards Easter Sunday, keep an eye on our social media channels for a new mini message series titled Why Jesus? Some of our church family will be sharing the significance and importance of Jesus in their lives. 
And finally, if you, st if you call Sterling Vineyard your home and want to contribute financially uh, to the work of the church, then you can do so on our website at sterlingvineyard.co.uk forward slash give. 10% of all church giving goes to our charity partners, Startup Sterling and Christians Against Poverty. We're now about to go over to Megan for communion and then we'll be led in worship by the Mackay Family Band. Special mm -hmm. thanks to our guests Beth and Cameron, along with our very own Nick. And then we'll be hearing from Rachel, who will be preaching this morning. Before that, let's just pray. Dear Lord, thank you for being with us this morning. We pray that the Holy Spirit would be upon us as we worship you. Uh, and I pray that um, you just help us come with open hearts um, as we hear your word this morning uh, through Rachel. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so if you haven't yet... Uh, go get your bread and some wine or juice uh, so that you guys can take communion. Um, so before we go on to communion, I just wanted to read a passage. So I want to read John chapter 6 verses 53 to 57 where it says, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. I just think this is a great reminder as we're coming up on Easter um, and at any time actually just about how great um, Jesus is and what he did for us. He died on that cross so that when God looks down at us, he sees Jesus. He sees this perfect person. He doesn't see all the sin that we've done, but he sees Jesus, his perfect son, and he loves us. And I just think um, how this passage speaks about how um, he's living in us. I just think that's a great reminder that we're not alone, but Jesus is with us. And I, yeah, just thought I'd share that with you guys before we go on to communion. Um, so, according to the example and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as a remembrance of him, we do this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance for me. In the same way, he took this cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take this and eat. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Do this remembering him. This cup is a new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed that the sins of many might be forgiven. Drink from it, all of you. I'm just going to pray for us just now. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much that you sent your son for us so that he could die, so that we could have an eternal relationship with you, that we can be close to you and that we can know you. Yeah, and I just thank you so much that um, when you look at us, all you see is Jesus and that love that you have for him and you love us in that same way. Yes, and Lord, I pray that we're just all reminded that you're here with us and, um, yeah, that you love us so much and that we should just come to you and we should, um, yeah, we should just know everything that you've done for us and um, be accepted, be accepting of that and just embrace that so much and um, grow in relationship with you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, let's just take this time to worship the Lord together. your 
Share. 
it's lovely to be with you all this morning. Um, I've never done a preaching from home video standing up, so this is the first time for me and I hope that it goes well. A lot of you know me, but for those of you who don't or have forgotten who I am because you haven't seen me in person for a whole year now, um, I'm Rachel. I am a proud animal owner and lover, a baker, and I've basically not seen any movies. Honestly, if you ever want to chat about a movie, just assume that I've not seen it, go and find my husband Owen and he is great to chat to. <laughs> I am originally from Stirling, although you might not guess it from my accent and I kind of hope that you can. But I've been a part of this church family for over two, maybe three years now, and I've just loved the journey and adventure that we've been on, seeing God's church grow right here in Stirling, and I'm so excited for more. I just want to say how honoured I am um, to be in your homes this morning. Thank you for inviting me in um, to talk to you, and I really hope that it won't be too long till we can all be together again in one place, worshipping God and drinking coffee together. We've come to the point in our Sunday morning service where we want to open God's words and hear from him um, together. And so I just love to pray for us as we do that. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your presence. And God, we just pray that as we open your word this morning, that you would speak to us. God, would you speak to our hearts? And would you teach us more about you? In Jesus name. Amen. Over the next two weeks, we are going to be thinking more about the question, why Jesus? Why do people all over the world choose to trust in Jesus today? And why do people 2000 years ago choose him first? And so to introduce that, this morning we're going to look at who Jesus or who is Jesus. This Sunday is known as Palm Sunday and it marks the start of the one week countdown to Easter Sunday, one of the most significant days in the Christian calendar. A day which changed the root of our lives forever and ensures that we have eternal life with God in heaven. What an exciting, important week we have ahead of us. So let's get stuck in. This morning I'm going to read from Matthew 21, 1 to 11 which says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfil what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread out their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before and behind him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Whenever I read this passage, it's one of the moments in the Bible where I genuinely want to jump into the book and join in. It holds a huge tension between what is happening and what is still to come. On one side, there's a crowd waiting expectantly for their king to come and they are desperate to celebrate him. And on the other hand, there are people waiting in the background, plotting to kill Jesus. Verse 8 says most of the crowd spread their clothes. Not everyone is on board, but I'm sure we'll hear more about that next week, so I'll leave it for now. And in the middle of all of this is Jesus. He rides in fully aware of the current situation, the cheering, the palm leaves, but he's also fully aware of his future, the pain he's about to endure, the suffering, the end of his life. And still he enters. And reading this passage, I think there's two important characters and groups for us to look at. So I'd really love us to look at them this morning. 
Firstly, the crowd. The crowd are such an important dynamic part of this passage. I love a celebration. The joy, the laughter, the cake, I am there for all of it. A few years ago, I was fortunate enough to take a gap year in Delhi, India. I'll not ramble on too much just now about how it's my favourite country ever and I loved it, but if you want to know more and see some terrible 2012 digital camera photography work, you know who to come and speak to. But I will tell you this one story. When I was there, I was living with three other girls in a little apartment and we'd been there for a few months already and somehow we ended up at a wedding for a couple we didn't even know. One evening, our street was filled with a huge wedding procession. Horses, bells, singing, people dressed up, the whole lot. It was fantastic. So we went out to take a look. And then we got invited to join in. And I am one, never to say no to a celebration. So we did. We ran back inside to get dressed more suitably for the occasion. And then we danced and ate food and met new people. And honestly, to this day, I am not sure who the bride and groom were, but I do know they had a lovely wedding and I had a fantastic time. Has that ever happened to you? You end up at a celebration. Maybe like me, you didn't know whose celebration it was, or maybe you did, but somehow you just get swept up into it all. You just want to feel part of that joy for a while. And the crowd in that passage, it happens to them too. The cheerers, the palm layers, the ones who are there to celebrate. In these verses, each of the people in the crowd has an expectation of who Jesus is and what he's there for. And as a result, they are swept up into the celebration. They lay their coats down and crowds part to make way for the honoured guest. It truly is a welcome fit for a king. Doing this is both a glance backwards in time and a look forwards to the return of Jesus in the future. The laying down of garments can be seen in other parts of the Bible, including in 2 Kings, where Jehu declared to the princes of Israel that he was the anointed king of Israel. And this act of spreading out clothing could be seen as one of recognition, loyalty and a promise of support. In the same way, the laying down of flowers or tree branches was a way to honour a warrior returning from victory or a king entering into his kingdom. It was a way of showing joy and a triumphant feeling and carrying palm and other branches was emblematic of victory and success. It was used by Roman soldiers as well as the Jews as a symbol of peace. And how fitting then that both of these are laid down in front of Jesus, the king returning. And yet it's also so significant that Jesus is entering Jerusalem, the city which was once made great by his ancestor David. And we can see throughout 2 Samuel, which says that David was made more and more powerful because the Lord was with him. While Jerusalem was once a great city, in the centuries after David, it was torn apart by conflict and decline. And by first, the first century, we see Jerusalem struggling to balance the secular authority from Rome and the religious leadership, a tension of two powers and a city in the middle. And the expectation of the crowd is that the Messiah will overthrow these powers and bring Jerusalem and all of Israel back into glory. And so the crowd cheers as the victor comes home. They proclaim that he is king. He is the son of David, the Messiah that they've been waiting for. And they shout Hosanna in the highest as Jesus enters. Hosanna is in this story and also in the account by Mark and John. And it's a phrase that would have been familiar to the Jews as part of their worship, as it's also found in the Psalms. Hosanna is a shout of praise and also a cry for help. Hosanna translates literally the Hebrew expression that was originally a cry for help, meaning save or saviour. In time, it became an invocation of blessing and even an acclamation. The people praise God in the highest heavens for sending the Messiah. And if Hosanna retains some of its original force, it is also a cry to him for deliverance. Palm Sunday isn't just an ordinary parade. It's a cry out for what's got, what God's people need. It's what they're looking and waiting for. 
And on this final Sunday of the period of Lent, we rejoice with the crowd that God has given us an incredible and much anticipated gift, a king. But Palm Sunday is also a funeral procession. The cheering and waving will stop soon and give way to pain, which eventually leads to the deliverance of the world in the favour of God. What a roller coaster of a ride. And so we've looked at the crowd and then there's Jesus. In my opinion, Jesus is a contrast to the celebration of the crowd. He is a serene, peaceful presence. Verses 10 and 11 have people in the city asking each other, who is this? And this is a pattern that we can see throughout many other moments in the New Testament, where Jesus shows up and people are left wondering, who is this man? And earlier in the book of Matthew, we see Jesus asking Simon Peter who he thinks Jesus is, to which he correctly replies, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And up until this point, Jesus has travelled around, met many people, he's performed miracles, fed those who needed it and collected himself a group of 12 followers. And still the crowd are asking, who is this? Who is this Jesus? What would you do if Jesus walked down your street? I posed this question to my small group this week and we had a whole range of answers which went from asking for his ID to find out who he is, asking him to sit down and have a chat because we've got some questions saved up, or spending time asking him if there's anything we can do differently or do better. All of the answers I got back are much calmer and more sensible than my initial response, which I said would have been to absolutely freak out. Jesus, the one that I've been reading and learning about for all of these years, outside my house, in my street. No, Jesus, you cannot come in for a cup of tea. You might realise that I have not done my laundry and I need to hoover. And yet in this passage, Jesus walks into Jerusalem and the crowds go wild. There's no fear, but they celebrate as we looked at a few minutes ago. In my ESV Bible, this section in the Bible is called the triumphal entry, which I think are incredible words that speak of the nature of Jesus. He's not triumphant by riding in on a grand horse with a big procession and fancy clothes. He comes in on a colt, which is described in Mark and Luke to be so young that it's never been ridden. And yet it is calm under the hands of the Messiah. It seems so fitting that the one who controls nature brings peace to this young donkey. And so Jesus enters fully the Prince of Peace. And in doing so, he critiques the makeup of the Roman Empire at the time. He turns notions of power and authority on their head. He reveals that you don't have to lead or pastor or rule by tyrannical domination and intimidation. You can simply walk in. And so it really was a triumphal entry. The triumph of humility over pride, poverty over affluence, gentleness over rage. On the surface, a seemingly harmless procession gives way to an earth-shattering reality. When Jesus enters Jerusalem and says that the whole city was in turmoil, it could be interpreted that the whole city shook, saying, who is this? Jerusalem shook like an earthquake in the presence of Jesus the King, because Jesus claimed the city's economics, politics and culture for the way of God. The city was shaken at its foundations. Unlike the prophets of old, whose words shook things up and declared that the Lord shakes the mountains, so his son Jesus shakes the world by his presence. After this moment, nothing will ever be the same again. And verse 5 reminds us that this entrance is entirely prophetic too. It was planned from the very beginning of time. God always knew that Jesus was destined for this moment. And so did Jesus. And this verse mirrors references listed throughout the Old Testament, including a verse in Zechariah 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem! See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
This event's in accordance with the divine purposes of God. Nothing at all is accidental. And Jesus, knowing what he already knows from the scripture, still had the courage to enter Jerusalem and do it in a really public way, which contrasts with his previous patterns of suppressing and hiding from publicity. Straight after this passage we read this morning, Jesus goes into the temple, overturning tables in his path and scolding those who had corrupted the use of the temple. He uses this opportunity to stand up for what's right, declaring that the temple should be a place for prayer and not a den of robbers. And then straight after that, he goes on to heal people who need his help. I love this distinction from being praised and welcomed in to the next minute flipping things upside down and disrupting what people were doing. Life with Jesus is unpredictable. It's not always what you expect, but it's so good. And Jesus walked into the crowd, embracing both the celebration and aware of his destiny, the death that awaited him. And he did that for us. He comes in a peace in the midst of the noise and he can do that in our lives too. When we're asking the question of who Jesus is in the lead up to Easter, I really believe this passage shows us that he is someone who is there for both the celebration and for the suffering. We have just passed the one year anniversary of entering into lockdown in the UK and it's been such a difficult year. One filled with pain and loss, distance from loved ones, and adjusting to a new reality. We continue to live in a tension, a place that is not yet perfect. And Jesus, our companion, is there through the highs and the lows of life. The one who sees the future and holds it all, but is still present in the here and now. I love this quote from Marcus Borg, who was an American New Testament scholar and theologian. And he says, Jesus is, for us as Christians, the decisive revelation of what a life full of God looks like. As the word and wisdom and spirit of God become flesh, his life incarnates the character of God and indeed the passion of God. How amazing, Jesus, the passion of God. And a true relationship with that Jesus is available to us. A one who embodies a passionate, loving, transformational God. I think the real meaning of Palm Sunday can be between us and God. A time for us to reflect on what Jesus laid down for us and decide how we want to respond. Are we celebrating him with the crowd, acknowledging the power of who he is, shouting Hosanna and crying out for his help? Or are we on the sidelines? While writing this talk, I was listening to Elevation Worship and kept coming back to the song Rattle. Probably a lot of you have heard it and if you haven't, go listen to it. It's been one of my favourites over the past year and it still honestly gives me goosebumps even though I've listened to it hundreds of times. The first few lines speak of Easter and what's about to come up next weekend and I'd love to share them with you. Saturday was silent. Surely it was three, but since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb, but since when has impossible ever stopped you? I'm probably stealing a bit of thunder from next weekend's Easter Sunday sermon, but this song really highlights the fact that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us now, today. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Our God cannot be stopped and we have this invitation to join him in this life-altering adventure where death turns to life, miracles happen and we cheer and celebrate the name of Jesus and the return of the King. So the question today is, who do you think Jesus is and what are you going to do about it? This invitation is there for us to embrace both sides of the story we've seen today. We can be part of the crowd, cheering, celebrating, welcoming Jesus in and rejoicing in what he has done as we synonymously cry out for his help. We have this opportunity to welcome in Jesus, our calm in the storm, peace over nature, the one who walked boldly towards his fate 
holding confidence in his father, the one who orchestrates all things for good and holds us all in his hands. Do you want some of that? Because I know that I do. We're going to move into a time of reflection and prayer. And if there's anything you've heard this morning or just something that you're thinking about in your heart that you would like prayer for, we would love to stand with you in that. Or if you aren't a Christian yet, but you really want to take that next step into an adventure with God, we would also really love to pray with you. You can just hit the request prayer button, which will take you into a private chat window where someone in our church will be ready and waiting. They'd love to hear from you and pray with you. And I'd also love to pray for us this morning to ask God to speak to us in all of these things we've heard about and give us an opportunity to respond. Um, so I'm going to pray and I would love it if you would join with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words that we've heard today about your love for us. And God, I thank you that you are a God who loves us deeply, who cares about our relationship with us and who wants to know us more. I thank you that you are a God who's there for us through the highs and the lows of life. And so God, I pray that wherever we are this morning, if we're up high on the mountaintops or we're deep down and we're in pain, God, I pray that you would meet each one of us where we are and that we would be able to respond to you. And God, I pray for us as we enter this final week towards Easter Sunday. God, that we would grasp hold of the incredible truth that you sent your son to die for us because you loved us and you wanted a relationship with us. God, would that be at the forefront of our minds? And would we just be so excited about the eternity that we have with you because of that? Yeah, God, we just want to thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. Would you continue to speak to us this week and help us to know your presence more? And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello again, and thanks to Rachel for that great message today. If you've been joining in with us at Stirling Vineyard and you want to connect, as a church, we would love to get to know you. So feel free to fill out an online connect card at stirlingvineyard.co.uk forward slash connect. Another way to connect with us is to follow us on Instagram or Facebook, or just feel free to get in touch by emailing hello at sterlingvineyard.co.uk. Thanks very much for joining us today, and we will see you all next week for Easter Sunday. And don't forget, there's a Sterling Vineyard Kids Zoom at 9am next week too. That's all from us today. See you next week. Bye. Bye.